Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. Um, how do you all like Berlin? Okay. Great? Uh, slides don't advance. Shit. Now, how do you like Berlin? Yeah, great. Cool. Uh, so I've been to a workshop last week uh, of the Open Tech School. That's where I'm a member. And uh, the Open Tech School does workshops for teaching um, absolute beginners to programming, how to program in, in Python and other languages. Um, how we do this is we gather a bunch of people, among them coaches, who are knowledgeable um, Python programmers who, who know how to program, and learners who want to learn how to program. They uh, have very different backgrounds, um, mostly non-technical people. And then we give them uh, material in digital form, mostly, um, so a website they can browse, um, and two hours of time to, to browse and, and work on the material and the exercises. So last week I was on such a workshop and was walking down the streets afterwards, and after the workshop um, I reached some kind of um, um, yeah funky place in Berlin and I saw this and said, <laughs> I was like, what? Why would anyone, I mean, this is the one style guide we all love and adhere to, and uh, yeah, you can take pictures. I can show you afterwards where it is. Uh, uh, maybe. <laughs> um, so somebody apparently was very set up uh, about Python style guides and adhering to, to um, coding style. Um, so I took a look at the Python material we currently have, like the tutorials and stuff, and if you look at the um, very official Python tutorial, it starts off with talking about calculations and stuff, and how do you add two integers to each other, how to do basic algebra. Um, it stops with some funky stuff about weak references, and that's pretty advanced for a tutorial, but okay. Um, so I scrolled through it, and what do you guys think where um, does it talk about the immutability of strings, for example? Just random guesses. To the end, to the middle, beginning? Middle, I hear middle. No, wrong, wrong. It's at the very beginning. It's the third chapter, actually. Like, right after talking about how do we add to integers, they go about talking about text and strings and, like, how do I do raw strings and escapes and um, how do I repeat literals of strings, like some arcane features not even experienced Python programmers ever use? And the Python tutorial just goes about and talks about that in, in length and very detailed. Um, it gets even worse um, at the beginning of the tutorial. They, like, the very first sentence you read in the Python tutorial is, hey, you can start the Python uh, interpreter with dash m, to import a module, or dash C to uh, invoke the command line, or dash I to do interactive uh, sessions. So, and if I gave that to a beginner in our workshops, they would be like, well, dash what? Nobody, nobody would understand that. Um, I had a look at Stack Overflow. Um, so there was some guy asking, uh, hey, I'm trying to teach uh, my brother or sister or someone uh, how, to, how to program, and he wanted to use Python. Um, and he asked about what is the best example project, example thing I can give them. Uh, what do you think? What would be, where would you start with a beginner? Any guesses? What? Turtle graphics, pretty good. Uh, anybody else? Databases, yeah, just shout out loud. Yeah, for kids, that's pretty good, yeah. Do you know what Stack Overflow side with? Yeah, just talk, to, teach them FizzBuzz. And I was like, what, why would you, I mean, I, yeah, FizzBuzz is a nice interview question, but why would anyone teach a beginner how to do FizzBuzz? I mean, having Hello World or FizzBuzz, Fizz, FizzBuzz on your command line is pretty nice, but not the best thing to learn programming, right? Um, and the trend continues. If you look at the Python books which are out there, like the uh, material universities have, for example, the MIT starts with object-oriented programming. This is the, the MIT SICP one, like, 6001 course. This is the very beginning to programmers. And they start talking about objects and inheritance and stuff. Um, so that's pretty funky. And so what you can observe is that the general trend in the Python community is to write references. So everybody wants to be a reference. Like everything needs to be correct and, and very, very right and very Pythonic and stuff. 
Um, and I understand that some people react very badly on this. Um, so if you take anything out of the session today, um, it is that references are not tutorials. These are very, two very different and distinct concepts. I would even say they are disjoint. Um, and do not intermix them. These are very different and require a different approach. So everybody speak off of me. References are not tutorials. Very good, very good. Great, you're doing great. Best audience I have ever had today. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I tried to come up with some points, like what would I say is a reference and what would I say is a tutorial. So in a, in a reference, you try to be very correct. Like every single thing you say should be correct. There should be nothing where somebody could come and say, no, this is wrong. Like this is clearly uh, not true. Also in a reference, you would always try to be complete. So I can well understand why the Python tutorial went about and talked about strings in, in depth, because it was a reference, right? It tried to um, examine strings and it tried to tell you everything it knows about strings, like they're immutable, you can slice and dice them, and you can count how long they are, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and also, most Python references try to be idiomatic, right? So um, for example, if you wanted to introduce loops to a beginner, then you would not want to, to introduce while loops and with index variables and stuff, but you would want to use the for loop with a range um, function, right? Um, I think this is the wrong approach for tutorials. For tutorials, you want to do a very different approach. You want to be comprehensible so that people can actually understand what you're talking about. You want to be coherent so that there's like a fine thread woven through the, the whole tutorial. And sometimes you want to be idiotic. And that might sound strange right now, but I uh, come to this in a second. So let's talk about these points in depth, and you'll maybe understand where the distinction comes from and how it makes sense. So I said tutorials need to be comprehensible. So one, one point I always try to make in tutorials is that it needs to be graphical, or it needs to be hands-on. You need to see something. You need to feel something. In the Open Text School, we use Turtle for that. So somebody suggested Turtle for, for teaching Python already. Um, that's a great tool, use it. Uh, you, can, you can, I mean, most of you know Turtle, right? Quick show of hands who knows Turtle? Uh, that's about 90% of the room, I would say, or 99 or something. Uh, so Turtle is a very nice tool for teaching Python because you can instantly see stuff and you can um, uh, get instant feedback, which is very great. Now, some people come to me when I suggest using Turtle and they say, ah, oh, Robert, Listen up, I know Turtle is pretty nice and it's like very old and people know how to use it, but it's so childish. Nobody wants to use it. Like this is for little little children. Why would I want to talk this to teach this to adults? Uh, which is always when I say no, it's not. It's so experience has shown that when we um, show the the turtle um, or turtle material to to adults, they react like this. They go, yeah, it's pretty childish, but let me play with it. So. <laughs> They, they spend two hours playing with it and instantly forget it's, it's for children. It's, it's very funny. Another thing to be comprehensible is uh, using their language. This applies to, to like any tutorial, not only Python tutorials, of course. Um, so that you don't speak about like uh, objects in the very beginning, but maybe you want to use things instead because people can understand what the thing is, right? The thing is maybe a car or uh, a person, but, but an object, like this is a very abstract concept. And try to use their, their language, not their, uh, not your concepts of the world. Another thing is use their language. So in the Open Text School, we translate our material, and this might come very obvious to most of you, but very few people actually do it. Like translating tutorials is still something I would say um, very few people do. Uh, and it's pretty important because you can do a lot of things uh, wrong with it. So um, you can, the one prime example about translations I always um, have is uh, culturally. So when you talk about, let's say, um, buying uh, something for US dollars, then um, it might not be obvious what that means to, to Chinese people or to European people, for example. So you want to translate that as well. It's not like only one-to-one -one translations. Um, other things you have to watch out is for is uh, that using markup in, in translations is very hard. Um, I can only recommend Sphinx for that, but disclaimer, I'm involved with that, so use whatever you want. Uh, and the last thing about translations I want to say is try to have one master set of translations. We've had translations where we had like a German version and an English version um, 
and they kind of diverged, and we had two different versions, and we didn't know, okay, this fix was applied to the German one, but was it applied to the English one? I don't know, well, hmm. So try to have the, the English or whatever language you prefer as a master set of translations and uh, always apply fixes to that and then translate them back into the um, other material. So we've spoken about how to make material comprehensible, like the, the individual units, but how do I make it so that it's uh, a whole different, uh, a different story, like uh, uh, one thing. Um, so very much like in, in music, you need to have some, uh, something which is the, the main voice of it, right? So you need uh, some kind of story which you wrote um, through it. So that, uh, that is not only in the material itself, but also in the, in the process of making the material. We've had material where um, we had a lot of people contributing to it, um, so to say a lot of voices, uh, and it kind of got very noisy. So the material um, diverged into very many directions and tried to have one main voice um, who says, okay, this material goes into that direction, and this is out of scope, this is in scope. One thing we programmers very rarely think about that is when we write Hello World, or when we write any example in programming, uh, we very often have a big context of concepts around it, which we programmers don't think about because we know it, but other people uh, have to be told what to do, like which editor do I use, which encoding do I use, this is not obvious. Um, this is also very easy, like you can tell them use whatever editor, but when it comes to other questions like which version do I use, people tend to say, yeah, just use free or Python 2 or whatever, um, make the decision. You are the informed person who can make the decision, not the learner. The very critical thing I have seen learners struggle with is the distinction between files and the shell. So uh, when you have the interactive shell, it's pretty nice for trying things out, um, but you want to have one point in, in the teaching process where you tell them, okay, this was nice, let's go to files because it's much better to, to maintain and stuff. Um, but have that one point. In, in our material in the Open Text School, we made the error that we kind of left it open for the learner to decide where they, at which point in time they want to switch to the, to, to files. And it, so you never knew it just, does that learner already know about files? Why does he use them? Does he use them? You never know. So pay attention for that. It's, it's a very critical distinction which uh, we intuitively make, but normal people, so to say, don't. The last point is probably the most confusing and surprising one, but I think tutorials sometimes need to be idiotic. So when you think about, um, I use this idiom and this style guide and whatever, and this is the one true right way to do it, forget about it. It's all bullshit. Um, I've seen people suggest very true stuff in the sense that it is sane for a programmer, but not for a learner. For example, take this suggestion. We had one material which was about data processing, and it needed to open and close files to read from them, and somebody came along and said, huh, well, opening, using the open function for files is not the best way to handle it because you can leak resources and stuff, so let's use the with construct, which is a very true objection, but is not helpful in the, in, in the context of uh, learning how to process data because opening files was not the main context, like it was, it was not the main goal. Um, people wanted to learn about data processing, not the with construct. This was um, not, the, not the objective. My favorite exercise uh, I always do with beginners is this one. I give them the uh, exercise, draw a rectangle. And they will happily oblige by writing code like this, right? So um, you move the turtle forward, you move it to the right, and do that four times, and then you have a rectangle. And then I tell them, okay, that was great. Now draw three rectangles. So they will go and copy and paste that code, so they now have three rectangles, which is very good. And then I come, I'm being very mean here, and tell them, okay, now resize the rectangles, make them twice as large or twice as small as they are. So the learners, having copy-pasted this code, need to go in and adjust every single orange integer you see over there, that's about uh, four, eight, 12 integers, if I'm correct, uh, which is very painful and not a nice experience for a, pro for a beginner, uh, which is the best moment you have in the teaching process 
to introduce the for statement. Because you can tell them, yeah, you would not have that pain if you used the for statement. It's pretty great. Use it. Um, I always call that the no pain, no gain strategy to teaching. Um, because if you try to let them go through that little pain, you can adequately teach them how to, um, how to use the abstractions and, and to value the abstractions you're actually uh, trying to convey. Um, I hope I got across the point that tutorials are not references to you and that you need to be comprehensible, coherent, and sometimes a little bit idiotic when trying to teach people Python or any programming language. Um, thank you for your attention, and um, I'm open for questions. Okay, thank you so far. There's one microphone over there. And... Oh, wow. So many. I think he was the first and then give it to uh, At which point do you explain uh, the difference between the reference model of Python and the way C does it for variables? Um, so because most of our audience is non-programmers, we don't have to explain the difference. <laughs> We can just explain the bare concept of references, right? And um, the, the metaphor I always use is using sticky labels. So that you put a sticky label on, on an object and then it has that name. Um, the point where we do that is pretty early on in the material when we talk about variables and uh, variable assignment. So um, that's the third chapter or something, it's pretty early. Because if you don't have to compare it to, to C and like this is a memory slot or something, then it's pretty easy to get across because it's, you only say it's a sticky note. But very good question. Uh, next. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I was curious about uh, the problem I'm um, faced with in general. That's the self-learned helplessness problem, I think, in teaching in general. but. Uh, software development in particular, that there's a lot of um, fear for the, oh, I can't do this, this is uh, only for the beta the guys, the geeks, and, and now it's popularizing, and what's your opinion about this? And maybe it's a general discussion within the teacher environment of uh, software and development to overcome that, uh, yeah, that problem of the scariness of people. Yeah, very good point. Um, I, I'm afraid I don't have a very good answer for you um, because people just sign up for our courses and uh, apparently those people are already motivated enough to, to do that. And they seem to have a non-technical background, so um, I, I'm not sure I know what is the reason for that. But if you, so I've had people, I, I've talked to people uh, and told them just try it, just give me this two hour workshop to try it. And then most people will come out of the workshop and be um, motivated enough to do it, um, which is also a very critical point because um, I've seen people like, when people prepare a workshop, most people are like, I need to explain them objects and loops and inheritance and uh, everything. Don't try to do that if you want to motivate them. Like only explain the very basic stuff you need to spark some inspiration in them. Uh, that's something we always do. Like the beginner course does not go into objects at all, I guess, um, because we just want to spark motivation in, in, the, in the audience, if that is an answer to your question. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the nice talk. I think it's uh, super fun to teach Python, so I do it myself, and I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, do you have any personal experience with using, using IPython notebooks for teaching purposes? The answer is no. Okay. <laughs> Good, because I, I think it's a uh, great... Let, let me, yeah. um, so some people in the Open Tech School use IPython, and uh, apparently they are pretty successful with that, um, but I can't say anything personally because I've not used it for teaching, so sorry. And uh, the second one, second one is, how much time do you actually spend on explaining syntax? Because Python is very simple, um, like syntactically, but I, in my experience, when people have never programmed before, and depending on what language they actually speak, it is a very difficult thing to 
explain that now everything really matters. You can't just switch things around, right? In some languages, the sentence structure is completely flexible. And in English, it's often quite flexible. So people think that if I turn things around, it should still work. But in Python, it's really important that, yes, if you initiate a for loop, you need this colon at the end, mm -hmm. right? And there need to be brackets around functions, these things. That's an excellent question. Um, so we don't actually do any syntax explanations to them, like going through all the syntax at once or something. Uh, we just tell them you need to write that in order to do that. Um, so, a very, so let's, for example, take the for loop, right? We, we show them a very simple for loop, and then we tell them, okay, now do the, the rectangle example or something. Um, and my guess would be that most people are if afraid enough of computers that they will just write what you told them to write um, in the beginning so that they know, okay, every single character was important. When they miss a character, they will just get a syntax error, right? So that's not too bad because then they will either fix it by just seeing the syntax error or they will ask one of the coaches and we can tell them, okay, listen up. Uh, this is a computer. He needs to understand you. You need the colon. Like, like everyone said, thank you for the, uh, for the talk. It was, um, I had a question about, because I organized a couple of uh, Python tutorials and some went really well and some went catastrophically bad. And the one uh, which went really bad was um, because I got asked a question and I kind of was stuck between a very easy answer and a very uh, comprehensive answer. And the question was, okay, you've introduced, you've introduced us with this for loops and if, but what do I want to do uh, software, software design for? Because I don't need a for loop, I want to do HTML. What? So I, I was basically stuck with having no answer to this, this person who was attending a software uh, development seminar without knowing why she was doing it. So uh, in, in these kind of events, you basically sometimes have to convince people that um, you have to explain to them why they need or what, why they might want to learn software design and software development. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they don't even know why they're here. And I feel that a lot of beginner tutorials do not even cover the, like, why would you even do Python or software development? Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if you have an idea about that or. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, the, the one reason I would say people don't ask that in our workshops is Turtle. Turtle is the single best teaching tool ever because they instantly see what they are doing and they are intrigued enough to, by, by that kind of graphic, um, graphical feedback that they will stick to it. So Turtle seems to be very powerful in getting people to actually wanting to do that stuff. Um, so maybe you just try Turtle and um, see if that gives any... Exactly. So, so he's just, just for the recording, he said that immediate feedback is important. And yes, immediate feedback is the one single best thing I would say in, uh, you can use in teaching. Yeah, so talking about error messages and reading errors when you have a syntax error, what I see from a lot of users, they don't know, if you're new users, how to read an error message. And you talked about translating. It's not just that it is in English, but there are words in there. This error message that they don't understand, like attribute, method, function, whatever. So how do you yeah, approach this problem? The simple answer is just ask them. So very often I see uh, the, the interpreter explode in front of people's faces, um, and they're like, oh, wow, crap. This did not work. Uh, I'm out of here. And then I just go to them and ask them, hey, do you have any clue what just happened? What does it say? And then people will start actually reading the error message if you ask them what just happened. Um, and that usually helps to, to get them uh, trying to understand uh, what the error means. And if you then ask them to explain to you what just happened, then they will kind of dig into it and, and uh, try to understand the, the errors at hand. Do you take people past Turtle? Um, so, so Turtle's a great teaching tool that teaches the syntax of the language, and it's fun. Um, but at some point, somebody's going to want to apply that to a real-world problem, and, and I wondered whether, how you bridge that barrier between kind of drawing pictures and searching file systems and that kind of thing. 
So I think, did I understand the question correctly that you are talking about real world problems and turtle? Okay. Moving from turtle yeah. to real world um, problems. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so the question was, uh, how do you move from turtle to, to real world problems? And that's indeed a hard topic. What we, um, so, so I spoke about motivation, right? So what we use turtle for is mainly the motivational part. Um, so to get people to, to, to like this programming thing, um, and whoops. Um, and you are right that Turtle is very limited in what it can do um, in a real world use case. We sometimes use like very simple drawing problems, like you want to draw uh, some nice, uh, let's call it animation, right? Like um, very contrived um, geometrical figures. Um, but this is where Turtle stops here, right? So Turtle is useful in getting people to understand the concepts. It's I would say not too useful in getting them to work on a project. That's very true. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, one more question because um, we have to switch rooms and stuff, and you can meet the speaker, I guess. Yeah, sure. Uh, on the... uh, hi. Uh, sometimes I have to um, teach people, of course, the programming or stuff uh, close to that, and um, there is one guy who's. Uh, who has this model of thinking that he's learning that way, that he sees um, a solution and he tries to repeat it. But of course, in this particular case, abstract thinking is really important, so this kind of uh, behavior is not successful. But it's, uh, it's really hard for him to ov overcome this model of thinking. Have you ever met such a, such a person? And if you did, how, how did you help him to overcome this very, very settled model of just mm -hmm. repeating solutions instead of finding analogies and thinking abstract? So the question was, um, how do you help people who have a very different model of thinking to adopt a new one? And so there's one story. I once met a guy who was apparent whose brain worked like functional programming which was pretty amazing to me, but, well, well. And um, I, I, I don't think there's a good solution to do that. Let, just let them do enough exercises which are well suited to the model of thinking you want them to, to um, uh, adopt, um, and that usually helps. Like, using exercises gets people into, into the right mood for, for um, critical thinking. That's, so hands-on is pretty important. Okay, thank you very much again.